this year, the grand prize for best weather presenter in the world went to Montreal's Frank Cavallero of CTV affiliate CFCF. Why do Good afternoon, 23 at the airport, 22 downtown, humidity high at 64%, feels like 26 degrees. Sweeping radar right now at 508, just a few clouds over Montreal. We picked up some showers, thunder showers earlier, your exclusive 8 to 8, cloudy periods. The sky will clear overnight, a very comfortable night. Hi, I'm Frank Cavallaro, and I'm going to be the next guest on Rob's Inner Circle. So don't go anywhere, stay right there, we'll join you soon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Rob's Inner Circle. I'm Robert Delessio, and I am your host, and we're broadcasting worldwide. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for tuning in to what is going to be another exciting show this evening. We want to take a moment to send our thoughts, our prayers, and our moral support to all the people in the Ukraine at this very moment right now, to the families, friends, relatives. We offer you our prayers and we hope that this conflict is going to come to an end very, very soon. I'd like to give a shout out to the producer of Rob's Inner Circle, my good friend, Jenny Duhame, and to the podcast technician, Patty, Lady Starlight Saragossa. Thank you, girls, for being there and for making this show as great as it is. Um, well, it's birthday candles for the following celebrants. Uh, today in Japan, our good friend Ryu Ryokat turns 18. Tomorrow, past Rob's Inner Circle guest Chelsea Jarvis is going to be celebrating her birthday as well. And the following day, Zach Phillips, who was also a guest on Rob's Inner Circle, is also going to be celebrating his birthday. To each and every one of you, on behalf of myself, Jenny, and Patty, Happy birthday and all that you wish and may the best happen to you. Congratulations to the good folks at MSOPA, uh, headed by Joe Sama, who celebrated their 30th year of excellence last week. So for acting classes, theater workshops, coaching, auditioning skills, etc., visit MSOPA.com. There are amazing teachers out there who can help you grow with the performing arts. Daily Struggles, the sitcom everyone is talking about, is on the Rise Up TV channel on Roku streaming service. Download the Roku app on your smart devices, or you can go to the Amazon store and get the Roku stick for as little as $30. Make sure you watch all of our productions on the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel. Comment, share, click on the like button, subscribe to Bobby Short Shorts, and hit the notification bell because anytime a new production comes out, you will be the first to know. All the Rob's Inner Circle merchandise is readily available at 514brandingco.com. We have amazing cups, mugs, <clears throat> T-shirts, Comforters, hoodies, you name it, we got it. That's all of the Rob's merchandise on 514.com. That's 514brandingco.com. Well, folks, it's that time once again. It's that time to get into our weekly ritual. It's time to sit back, relax, kick up your feet on the edge of the table, get that glass of wine, and let us carry the load. Folks! It's Paisano Get Together Night or Night on Rob's Inner Circle. We have an amazing guest who's been recognized two years in a row, both in 2001 and 2002, as the best weather specialist in the world at the Weather Oscars in Paris. He's also known as a radio and TV broadcaster, and he's now hailing out of Florida for the next few months to stay away from the bad weather we're getting. So to open up our show, 
And with a special weather report coming to you live from Florida, here's our guest tonight, Frank Cavallaro. Hey, Robert. How are you? Staying warm? Frank, we're trying to stay warm over here. We've had, like you were saying, like you've observed from a distant place somewhere in the world, <laughs> you were saying that uh, we've had a, a bad January, a bad February, and we have some pretty bad weather coming up right now. But Frank, you know, since you're such a seasoned weatherman, can you give us the weather report for the next coming days for the Montreal region? Well, I know the Montrealers won't want to hear this, but there's more <laughs> snow coming up uh, tomorrow, which is Tuesday. Uh, five to 10 centimeters of snow. It's cold right now, minus 16. It's also windy. It feels like minus 21. Uh, minus six on a Tuesday, uh, five to 10 centimeters of snow. And then you'll see flurries on and off. It'll warm up a little bit on Wednesday and more light snow about minus seven, a couple of centimeters of snow on Thursday. Right now, minus 16 in Montreal, where I'm at here near Hallandale Beach, Florida. It's 24 Celsius. So, Robert, it's 40 degrees warmer here than it is in Montreal. So, Frank, are you trying to tell me you, you expect to make some friends tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I used to like winter as a kid. But the last 10 years, I really, I, I, I don't like, it's just too long. Winter should be, you know, December 15th to January 15th for the holidays. But it starts in November and it ends in April. Uh, tomorrow is March 1st, and there's five to 10 centimeters of snow moving in for, to Montreal. As they say, my mom used to say, you know, I used to say, Ma, why are we getting snow? It's mid March. And she'd say, Rang, March is pats. March is crazy. You can yes. get 10 degrees one day and 20 centimeters the day after. So until, <laughs> until you hit mid April, uh, anything can happen in the month of March. It's, today is the final day of February, so tomorrow <laughs> get ready for some snow in southwestern Quebec. Wow, that was a really nice weather report you gave us here in Rob's Inner Circle. Thank you so much, Frank. You're welcome. <laughs> the check's so, in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> so, Frank, you and I go back a very long time because I was a city bus driver in the south shore of Montreal, and I was working on Saturdays. I mean, Saturday mornings were... I'd be tuning in to Lisa Christensen on CJD at 10 o'clock. And then in the afternoons, it was Frank Cavallaro on Mix 96. So, Frank, I want to tell you now for then, I just wanted to thank you so much for having made my life that much better because my Saturdays were just a lot of fun with you behind the mic. So, Frank, I just wanted to thank you for that. No problem, Robert. I got to tell you, I had a lot of fun working uh, in Montreal at uh, Mix 96. I did weekends. I filled in during the week. I was there for about, uh, well, about 15, 16 years. Then I ended up doing TV on a full-time basis. But I enjoyed radio. I still do radio now every Saturday uh, from 12 to 3 on CJMQ, a station in the eastern townships. Um, they're in the townships. You can, on your smart Uh, speaker. You can just tune in to CJMQ every Saturday, 12 to 3. I play music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. I'm having a lot of fun. I look forward to it. Uh, even though I'm in Florida, I'm having a lot of fun. I do it every Saturday. I'm playing music that brings back a lot of memories of when I started in radio back in 1980. So uh, yeah, I had fun at Mix at CJAD. I did some shifts at CFQR, Q92, also at Shome. I pretty at CFCF radio. I've worked just about at every radio station in Montreal. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, I still enjoy doing radio because, you know, see radio, you don't have to worry about your hair, hair looking good or shaving or nobody gets to see you. TV, you know, you got to put on makeup. You got to put on a shirt, tie and a jacket and you got to shave and put on some makeup. And uh, so I still enjoy doing radio. So uh, on the news telecasts, uh, do you have actual people doing your hair, doing your makeup? And you also have, um, back then it was Dorian Suits. I can't think of anybody right now because they're all closing because of the pandemic there. But you have like a, a suit outlet that provides you with clothes? Well, I have to tell you, um, for many years, we had a hair person, uh, a hairstylist and a makeup artist. Uh, both at CTV and at CBC. CTV still does, but uh, the years have gone by. Uh, some stations are not having, we do our own makeup. 
uh, you know, for the last 15 years, I did my own makeup at CBC. So, uh, you know, for a guy, it would take me 15 minutes. For all the girls I worked with at CBC, it would take them a lot longer. Uh, you know, I worked with Deborah Arbeck and a lot of other reporters at CBC. So a lot of stations now, you do your own makeup. Uh, hair, there's no hair play, hair person at the, the station. We're at CBC. So you fix your own hair. And I'm having a bad hair day today. I need a haircut. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, now we do most of our own stuff. I mean, uh, stations are saving money. They give us a course on how to put on your own makeup. And uh, that's, how it, that's how it's been at, uh, at CBC. Are there any makeup brands that you prefer? Listen, I was using MAC for many years. I still do. I still have a little makeup kit uh, in case somebody calls me and says, Frank, you have some makeup. We need you to go on. I, I use MAC. I use, uh, I forget the other name, uh, but I, I, usually, I usually stick to MAC. That's what I usually use as makeup. So I wouldn't know anything about uh, uh, makeup, but Maybelline, maybe for the uh, for the women. Is that what they use? <laughs> I don't know. Let's have some of the women that are listening in tonight. See, there you go. Jenny says Mac is her favorite, and NYX. I don't know what NYX is, but uh, uh, yeah, I use Mac. I mean, uh, the Mac people are good. I walk into a, a Mac store and they'll uh, sit down with you and they'll try different shades and stuff. And uh, I've used Mac for many many years. Well, I went into a Mac store and I ended up walking uh, out with a three thousand dollar computer. So I guess it's a different. <laughs> so Frank, let's go back to your childhood. Where were you born? I was born in the Cotonou area on Barclay. Uh, my my folks moved here in 1956, and a few years later, I was born on Barclay. We lived in Barclay uh, on Barclay for about. I think five or six years. Then I moved to Park X. Uh, I was in Park X for a few years. On I lived on Bloomfield. My cousin lived on Wiseman. My other cousin lived on uh, Stewart. So I lived in Park X. Then from Park X, we moved to Montreal North, north on Fleury near St. Michel in one of those block apartments. Uh, then from there, we moved to Ahuntsic. Um, between Papineau and St. Michel near Sauvé. My brothers went to Pius 10th High School. I went to Pius 9th High School, the one on PNF where Dick Hans is. You know, there's Dick Hans, those hamburgers on uh, PNF and Montsolet. Now there's, it's been under construction for the last 10 years, so you can't really drive through there. But uh, that's my high school. I think now it's uh, an adult education center. Uh, so my brothers graduated from Pius 10th. I graduated from Pius 9th because when we moved from Montreal North to Ahuntsic, I already had started at Pius 9th, and I asked my parents if I can continue school at Pius 9th, and they said yes, and my brothers graduated from Pius 10th, uh, both of them, Julio and Nino. So uh, Esther <clears throat> came up with a uh, comment, and she recommended something. I don't know if Patty could find the, the uh, comment that Esther put up. There you go. Dior, the best foundation. Yeah, yeah. Dior, Mac. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, companies out there. And uh, by the way, you asked me about the clothing. Uh, I have a tailor that I usually go to, uh, Tony Lombardi's in St. Leonard. But I also get a lot of my clothes from Signor Terry on Jean Talon near, uh, between St. Michel and PNF. Terry and Joey. Uh, great place. You know, uh, we have some fun, good coffee as well. Uh, so I go see Senor Terry for jackets and shirts. Uh, my ties are usually supplied by Polly Froney on PNF. Um, for years, they've been supplying my ties and some of the shirts. Uh, but Tony Lombardi, you know, if I want a tailor-made suit, I go see him in St. Leo. He's great. And he'll, he'll watch me on air. And if he doesn't like something, he'll call me up and say, Frank, bring that jacket in. <laughs> it's got to be tightened or it's got to be loosened. He, he, you know, he's... He's a master tailor that just, uh, but I enjoy going to Senior Terry as well. Uh, I'm picking up some clothes there. So as you were growing up, were there any indications that you might have some kind of a, an appetite to go into the media, whether it be broadcasting for news, being on TV? Was there any indication that you might be heading that way? Well, um... <laughs> I, I, 
I didn't really have an idea, Robert. I'll tell you what happened. Uh, during my high school days, whenever we had a party at a house, when we were all like 15, 16, 17, uh, in Montreal North, because I, I, I was a pious nine, uh, I used to be the DJ. For some reason, I became the DJ. So if we had a house party, let's say at Gino Brunetti's place on St. Vital, he'd say, Frank, bring your, bring your records. I have the turntables. Uh, if we had a party at uh, Carlo Coppola's house, I bring the re I bring the the record. So I ended up being DJ at all these house parties, high school parties with my high school friends, and I liked playing records. Um, after I graduated from high school, I went to Champlain College. They had a great radio station there, and I took radio, TV, film courses there. After Champlain, I went to the University of Ottawa. They had a great radio station there as well. So that's how I got into radio. I started off as being a DJ. But no, I never thought, you know what? You're 15. You're about to graduate in a year or so. I didn't know. I just said, this is fun. Why not do it? And getting paid for it, why not? Well, sometimes there are things that happen that we don't know. Like when you were 15 years old, the, being the DJ for your friends uh, at parties and all that, this was all happening because it was actually a precursor to what lied ahead for you. You know, it's true. When I think of it now, you know, I was, uh, I, I had a lot of fun. My friends always so, sort of pushed me to be the DJ. And, and when I said, you know what, I can do this on radio. I started in radio in 1980 in New Brunswick and, and I got paid for it. Not much, but I got paid for it. I said, why not? This could be a great career. And then radio led to television. And uh, I've been at it for, you know, for over 1980, uh, over 40 years. So Antonia has an interesting comment here. She goes, I haven't heard talk about uh, turntables in years that bring back good memories. Well, Antonia, uh, turntables are making a comeback. A lot of DJs now in the business are going back to turntables. Uh, they're using records, vinyl. Uh, majority of them still use uh, computers. Uh, but turntables are making a comeback. I don't have one anymore. I got rid of all my vinyls last year. I sold them because I didn't have a turntable. And but I had, you know, I had a couple of thousand records, forty fives, and 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 albums. But uh, yeah, turntables are making a comeback. And why do you think that uh, vinyl records are making that comeback? Nostalgia, uh, you know, a good turntable and a clean, good, non-scratched vinyl. The quality is always better than using a USB or an MP3. That's what I've been told by DJs that use it. And you can mix. You know, it's it's more of a challenge to mix. Today, it's so easy to mix. I mean, you get... Two laptops, you download the music. You know, Madonna's Holiday is uh, 110 beats per minute. You find another song that's 110 beats per minute. You mix it in. You, you look like a fantastic mixer. But in my days, we used records. And you would speed up the record. We had a, oh, a speed dial. And it was, it, it was tougher to mix. And if you did a good mix back in, you know, and when I started, you were good because... And then you got to be careful. You don't touch the needle because it'll skip. Uh, so it's a lot easier now with the beats per minute and the, the equipment they're using. So to go back when you were going to CJP and all that, you had a choice either to go to Dawson or Champlain College. Uh, you chose Champlain. Why is that? I chose Champlain because they, I, at that time, I, I thought they had a better communication program. They had a radio station. And you know what, I, I just wanted to try South Shore, St. Lambert, you know, uh, it was a long way uh, from uh, Hunsick. Uh, I remember going, you know, you had to take uh, the bus, the metro, and then walk a good 15 minutes. You got off at the Long Game Metro and you had to walk underneath Jacques Cartier Bridge and go to the school. I just liked their communication program. I saw the courses they offered, some were in English, some were in French. And I liked the radio station. I, I, that was one of the reasons I chose, I chose Champlain over Dawson. And you remember the radio station's name, right? Uh, uh, C-H-A-M. Sham. 
as uh, that was like a um, like like a, what we could say like a shout out to Shom. Yeah, C H A M, Champlain Regional College. We played the music in the band ring. It was fun. I used to do I think two shows a week, a couple of hours uh, at a time. So, and that's where I really got the bug. And then I said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to go to university now. And I saw University of Ottawa. I like their I like their communications program. They had a great radio station, C F O R. Was it CFOR? CFOR. And uh, I ended up going to University of Ottawa. I ended up living with three Italian guys who all became lawyers. All my friends, they're all from Montreal. I was the only guy in communications. These guys are all established lawyers now. Um, uh, Sam Coppola, as well as uh, who else lived? I can't remember now. We're going back 45 years. Hold on. Sam Coppola. Uh... Uh, Carmen Zenga and Perry Morella, who's not a lawyer, but he works in Ottawa. I lived with these guys, and it was funny because when you study law, you're in the books all the time. These guys were studying 15, 16 hours a day. I was in, I was in communications, Robert. I was going to school, coming back, having supper, and going out. And then I got a job as a DJ in Ottawa at Brandy's, <laughs> which was one of the hottest clubs. And these guys would look at me and say, Frank, how do you do it? You go to school. You come home, you study for an hour, and then you go play music at a, at a club. <laughs> and when I'd come back, they were still studying. Oh, my God. And now they're all, they're, you know, two of them are lawyers. One of them has a job with the, with the government in, uh, in Ottawa. But uh, it was fun. We have a special request here from our, an audience member, Don Emilio Zeno, who's very active tonight. Thanks for, <laughs> for being part of our show, Dean, uh, Don. So uh, Don asks, Frenchy, <laughs> talk to us about your 12-inch zucchini contest. <laughs> okay, when I worked at CTV, C CFCF, Pulse, whatever you want to call it, uh, it started off really as a joke. Um, I came in one day. We're talking about 20 years ago now, 20, 25 years ago. My grandfather, God, God bless his soul, he had this wonderful garden in Ahuntsic on Zhe Gagne Street. And every time I'd go to his backyard, he'd say, Frank, come and look at my vegetables. And he would grow these zucchinis. I'm telling you, they'd be from three feet to seven, eight feet. And I'd say, how the hell do you do this? He goes, well... <laughs> I talk to it. I, I give it a bit of homemade wine. Instead of just water, I put a couple of drops of homemade wine. I don't know if it was true or not, but that's what he told me. So I said, can I have this one? He had a four and a half foot zucchini. It was big. It was thick. It was big. And I brought it on the air. I brought it on the air with Mitsumi and Bill Holland. I was doing the weather, and I surprised them. I said, the, you know, and I had to tie it into weather. It was like September. I had to tie it into weather. And I said, for this zucchini to grow so big, that means we've had an abundance of rain and an abundance <laughs> of, of sun because you need rain and sun. Exactly. <laughs> and I showed this zucchini and Matsumi says, wow, this thing is big. And Bill goes, when they were laughing, you know. The minute I got off the air, we didn't have social media then. We didn't even have email. <laughs> I got all kinds of calls. No way. <laughs> Hey, Frank, my uncle Robert has a big zucchini. My aunt, my aunt Olivia has a zucchini. So we said, you know what? At that time, again, we didn't have social media. So I would send the camera person, a cameraman to that person's house to shoot the zucchini. He would, he would take the video back to CFCF. I would edit it and show it on the air. And we said, let's do a contest out of it. And we did. We did a contest. We had... Uh, how big is your zucchini? And I even got a sponsor. I got Esposito Food Markets, the Esposito family, was nice enough to sponsor it. I think they gave $500 in groceries to the biggest zucchini. And every year it became a big thing. It really became a big thing every year. <laughs> and at one point, they wanted to take it off the air, but because I kept on getting sponsors, when you get sponsors, the station makes money. Of course. <laughs> they said, well, leave it on. So we did it for year and year and year and year. I did it last year on Facebook. It was fun. And I got a sponsor as well. I didn't do it this year uh, because of the pandemic, because of whatever. But next year, I might bring it back on, on TikTok, on Instagram, on, 
on Facebook, <laughs> on whatever's out there. I don't know how many <clears throat> platforms are out there, but we might do the zucchini contest again next year. So, Frank, uh, you get out of university, you're in Ottawa. Where is it that you landed your first job? My first job was in the dairy capital of New Brunswick, Sussex, New Brunswick, like Sussex, where the prime minister lives. Sussex, New Brunswick. I got my first job five days before Christmas in 1980. And I have to tell you, I had never been to New Brunswick. I got the job. They said, we want you here by December 20th. I left the 19th. There was a big storm. I had a I had an old Mercury Capri back wheel drive with snow tires on. And I, it took me like 15 hours to get to Sussex, New Brunswick. Uh, Joe Leone was my program director. He hired me. I did the afternoon show. They put me up in a hotel for about a week. Then I found an apartment with the morning man. We lived together. And that's my first job. And I had a lot of fun. And we have Teresa Picciano, who's a, an active member of the audience this evening as well. My dad was always looking forward to the zucchini contest. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was a lot of fun. And it became, it really, it really became an international event, Robert. You know, we always think Italians, Sicilians, Calabres. But the last <laughs> four or five times, the last four or five times I did the zucchini contest, it was like the International Jazz Festival. We had, wow. we had Ukrainians, Russians, uh, Portuguese, uh, every nationality that had a garden that grew with zucchini wanted to enter the contest. So it became an international <laughs> event. Wow. <laughs> so you traveled quite a bit. You were all over Canada. You went to Winnipeg, um, Sherbrooke. You also went to um, New Brunswick, Fredericton, Sussex. Then you end up at CFCF12 on Pulse News. So how did all that come about? You know, Robert, I never thought I was going to do TV. Honestly, I didn't think I was going to do TV. The way TV happened is I was working in Sherbrooke at CKTS Radio. I was doing the afternoon show with my friends, Ted Silver, Al Roberts, um, Danielle Coloma, and a few other people. And while I was working in Sherbrooke, on weekends, I'd come back home to visit my mom and my dad. They, my mom still lives in Ahuntsic. She's 83, going on 84. Um, I come home on the weekends, and I saw this ad in the Gazette, looking for weather people to do weather. No TV experience necessary, but if you have a radio background, that could help. I applied. I applied for the job. Uh, they went on air in September of 1988, the Weather Network and Meteo Media, which is Meteo Media still today, on Papino and Rene Levesque. I applied. They hired 24 people. I was the 25th. They didn't hire me. They said, you're the first person we're going to call if somebody quits, something happens, you're the first person I'm gonna, uh, we're going to call. And Robert, the truth is, I didn't think... Um, I didn't think I was going to get the job because, you know what, I always had done TV, even though I always had done radio, I had no TV experience. You know, I was overweight. I still am today, but I was really big. I had a mustache. I had long hair. I looked like a, for, I looked like a hitman. That's what I looked like. <laughs> well, you know, you ended up being a hit, man. <laughs> Good one. I didn't think I was going to get the job. You know, I had one suit. I swear, I was doing radio. I had one jacket, one suit, one tie. I said, if I get this TV job, I won't. I'm going to have to wear the same jacket every day. Oh no! Anyways, they call me up. They hire me, and I cut my hair. I got a couple more jackets. I lost some weight. I shaved my mustache, and I ended up working there. I ended up staying there eight or nine years while I was working there. And I loved working there, by the way, because I love weather. I love geography. We used to do five hours. My shift was five hours of weather a day, five days a week. We did 25 hours. I did 25 hours of weather a week, live weather, nothing taped. Every segment was a minute and a half to two minutes. So if you can do one year at the Weather Network, it's equivalent to 20 years 
at CFCF <laughs> or CBC because you're doing so much weather. So I gained so much experience. I was getting good at it. I was having fun. I did everything from sunshine destination, ski reports, uh, marine report, snowstorms. I covered everything. While I'm doing this, Don McGowan calls me up and says, Frank, we need someone to fill in at CFCF. Would you be interested? I said, sure. So I asked my boss at the Weather Network, and he said, sure. I mean, it's not a conflict of interest because the Weather Network then was only seen in Ontario, uh, outside Quebec. So I ended up working part-time with Don McGowan, Suzanne Deshotel. And whenever they would go on travel, travel, I'd fill in for them. So at one point, I was working a lot at CFCF. I was working almost as much at CFCF as I was at the Weather Network. Then one day, McGowan called me in and said, listen, uh, you're working a lot. Why don't you join us on a full-time basis? So I left the Weather Network, and I went to CTV, and I was there 17 years. I got laid off in 2008. And then CBC hired me a couple of months later. And I was at CBC till February of 2020 when I got laid off there. They did not renew my contract. I did not retire. And I'm unemployed and I'm looking for work. So if you need a good weather person, you let me know. Who knows? We might have a weather segment <laughs> in our show here. The way things went tonight. <laughs> we have a trivia question for the audience. CFCF. What do those call letters mean? You have the, the next half hour to give us your answer. Frank oh, you probably want, knows. You want me to answer? Oh, you want somebody to answer. Oh, somebody to answer. But you, you know what you know they are, the call letters, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, for the sake of uh, keeping the audience a little bit on their toes, let's see if they're sharp, if you can give us what the answer is. Frank, uh, <clears throat> tell us... Uh, you're doing the weather and all that. We're watching you do what you're doing. And it looks so easy, but you really got to know your stuff. Like there's a ridge coming in from the west. You got the side, northerly, northerly winds with a cold front. And, you know, watching, watching you, it looks so easy. But you, you really got to know your geography to be doing this. <laughs> yes, you do. And you know what? I love geography. I still do. Uh, you know, before GPS came out, I used to look at maps. I, I love maps. I love, you know, uh, I went to Italy. I went to Europe in 1981 with a couple of friends, Enrico and Nick. We had maps. We went all over. We went to uh, Spain, France, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, Italy, and we used maps. I love, lo I love looking. Even today, I'll look at a map and I'll say, look, there's the river, there's the lake. Uh, here's the road. Here's the highway. I love I, that. I always love geography. And I want to thank John Marinelli, my geography teacher um, at Pius Ninth. Uh, I had a great time. Uh, yeah, but you have to know geography. You have to know what you're talking about. Unfortunately, today, Robert, especially in Canada, uh, a lot of the people working on air just read what you see. They just say sunny and 22, sunny and minus 10. They don't really know what's happening they don't know why it's minus 22 why there's a storm coming in um it's sad because i watch a lot of weather i still do i watch a lot of canadian weather in the states it's not as bad in the states you need some experience you need um uh to know what you're talking about but in canada now i find a lot of stations Listen, they hire for different reasons. You know, they don't hire because you're talented. They're, they don't hire because you know weather. Uh, and I'm not just talking about weather. I'm talking about being a reporter, being a sportscaster, being an anchor. Uh, but in my field, weather, I find that in Canada now, uh, not everybody. Some stations hire uh, credible weather people. But some stations just put you on because you look good or because whatever, you know. Uh, gender, race, sexuality, religion, that's how they, a lot of stations hire based on that. They don't really look at the best, knowledgeable, credible weather person that works on air. It's sad, but that's the way it is today. I mean, there's nothing, you know, the times have changed. I mean, what do you want me to tell you? We got Don Emilio here who's made an attempt to answer the trivia question, but he's failed miserably. But hey, you know, it's it's nice. It's a nice answer. It's plausible, but that's not exactly <laughs> what it means. <laughs> we also have a question. Oh, there we go. Teresa Picciano. Very good. Congratulations. You got it. It's, isn't it actually Canada's 
it's kind of this first kind of this fine. Yes, she got it. Congratulations yeah. to you, Teresa. That's what it is. <laughs> there's a, there's a, we also had another question um, uh, talking about Cabal's Patty. I don't know if you can find that question again. Maybe it's two or three comments. Yeah, there you go. What about the Cabal's? I'm not too sure what the gentleman is talking about, but you seem to know. The Cabal's. The Cabal's. Yeah. Uh, I guess these are the people that are trying to rule the world. Is that what the Cabal's are or the... Uh, um, I don't know much about the cabals. I mean, uh, maybe some of our other uh, people who joined us tonight would know about the cabals. Well, uh, Frank, you're a very tal talented gentleman. There's secrets that you've been keeping from uh, people because you're good with the radio. <laughs> you're good with television. You're a great speaker. You're good at raising uh, funds for foundations and all that. We're going to be getting to that a little bit later, but you're actually a fantastic dancer and the people do not know this. So Frank, we're going to be sharing something very special with the audience. We're going to be sharing with the audience, your dancing skills. Folks, okay. tie on your toques, tie on your hats, because this is going to be really exciting. This is Frank at his best. He can really party up a storm. Congratulations, man. I really feel like dancing, man, after seeing that. <laughs> yeah, that wow. was a long time ago. That was about, uh, man, like 10 years ago, I think. About 10, 11 years ago. We're getting to your fundraisers uh, in a little while. Uh, you worked on AM and FM radio. Obviously, there's a big difference between the two. Uh, which do you prefer? Well, uh, my first FM experience was in Winnipeg at Q94 FM. Um, in Winnipeg, I was there a few, almost a year. Um, back then, even now, but back then when FM was like sounded great because of the stereo sound, on AM, it's it was mono. FM had certain rules. You had to do a lot more show prep. You had to talk about the artist. It was a lot of work. I mean, AM when I worked AM in Fredericton at CFCF in Montreal. In Sussex, I found it easy. You play music, you talk about the artist, a couple of jokes, and off you go. But FM, um, you know, you had mosaics, you had to talk about the artist, uh, you had to do a lot of work. You couldn't just go on and play, you know, that's Van Morrison or that's Bon Jovi. You had to talk about the artist, to enrich, uh, enrich the, the commentary. You had to come up with info on the artist. So that was my first experience. And I think even today on FM stations, when they do special shows, um, they have to come up with it. You can't just play music. I mean, in Canada, that's the way it used to be. And I think it still is today. And for your information and dear audience, uh, AM, what does that stand for? Well, you know what? We'll give Frank a crack at it. What does AM stand for? Uh, AM sounds for uh, the morning. Get up in the morning. It, it, it's actually, <laughs> that's a great try, Frank. It's actually amplitude modulation. modulation. And FM is? Take a crack at it, Frank. Frank Formaire. How's that? No? Fra uh, Framplitude modulation. <laughs> it's actually frequency frequency modulation frequency modulation and that is why that is what differentiates the two um signals the frequency modulation you get a much clearer sound and that crispy sound you're coming out of the radio whereas am it sounds muffled yeah am has improved considerably since then it's still not like fm that's why music stations do well on fm and talk stations do better on AM. So you're getting ready to go uh, to do the weather on Pulse News. What, what would your day be like? The news is at six. What time would you actually get there? Uh, well, when I worked at CFCF, I used to do 12 and six. I'd get there at about uh, 10.30 in the morning. My shift was 10.30 to seven. 
we worked uh, we worked about eight hours, eight hours a day. You got to do preparation, check the weather data, check the computers, build your maps. People think you just go on the air for three minutes and you're done. You got to prepare everything. You got to know what you're talking about. This is what I was saying before. You got to know what you're doing. And today, on a lot of Canadian stations, they they talk. I mean, anybody can read. If I asked you, Robert, to lead, to read what's on the screen right now, it would be easy. You just read what's on the screen. You'd say, Robert D'Alessio, Frank Cavallaro, you're in the show, live. That's what a lot of people do now on TV. I'm talking about a lot of the people that were hired that don't know the weather and don't know meteorology. So... Um, you have to prepare. I mean, listen, I, for if I just did the 6 o'clock show, uh, I would go in around 2, 2.30, and I finish at 7, 7.30. Wow. So that's a lot of preparation. And your spot was what? Was it three minutes when you were doing the weather? 2.45 to 3.15. Uh, the weather person is always the person who fills the gaps. In other words, if the newscast is too short, they would give us more time. They'd say, Frank, we're going to give you an extra 45 seconds. And I'd love to get time because the more time you get, the more you can explain what the weather is going on, how, what's happening with the weather. You can take your time. You can slow down a bit. But a lot of times I'd say, Frank, uh, Bob Benedetti went long. He went too far. Now you've only got two minutes for weather instead of 245. Then I oh. have to speed up. I was always the buffer. I was. I would always have to. Okay, Frank. That's why they. If you notice, they always put weather at the end because we would fill the gap. And that's you know you gotta you gotta know what you're doing because if you're used to doing three minutes and all of a sudden in your ear because you have an earpiece, your director says, "Frank, I'm sorry, but Robert D'Alessio went too long again. We <laughs> warned him." What? You, you How could that happen? Me? Well, no, not me. You've only got a minute and 45. Well, then you got to go through your maps faster. You got to speak faster. You still have to tell the story on why you're getting the weather you're getting. And, you know, when I won those weather awards in Paris about 19 years ago, I was surprised because, but the reason they told me I won is because I was able to tell a weather story in a short period of time. And I wasn't, I, I just wasn't reading the sun and the moon. And the rain, I was telling people why we were getting the sun, why we were getting the rain, why it was cold. Why? So that's when they voted for me. Over 120 presenters voted for me because they said, boy, this guy in three minutes explained everything on what was happening. He, he simplified science in three minutes. And that's why I won those awards two years ago. Isn't it geography that you simplify? <laughs> <laughs> yes, geography too, but also it's science. Weather is a science, you know, the lows and highs and the ridge and the high pressure and the low pressure and the and the this and the that. And you got to explain that, you know, because listen, otherwise everybody just reads what they see on screen. So Frank, we, we talked about uh, Paul's news. We're going to be closing off uh, pretty soon. We want to talk a little bit about your experience with Deborah Arbeck and the CBC News as well, uh, the CBC News broadcast. You work with Mitsumi Takahashi, Bill Hoagman, Ron Roosh, Randy Teeman. You work with some pretty big names. Don McGowan. Yeah. That must Brian, have been a, a thrill of a lifetime. Brian Britt. Yeah, great people. Listen, I got to tell you, I've worked with some, uh, you know, uh, excellent people in the business so over 40 years at CFCF and at CBC. Uh, in radio, some great people uh, in Fredericton, Doug Pond, uh, Joe Leone, as well as... Uh, uh, Sherbrooke, Ted Silver, uh, you know, people, Jack Curran, who gave me a chance at CFCF Radio, um, went, out, went out to Winnipeg, uh, then I worked at Mix, Pat Holiday, Jeff Vidler. I mean, you know, I worked with some great, great people. Yeah, you know, when I got, when I met Don McGowan the first time, you know, I was doing weather at the Weather Network. Uh, you know, he was an icon uh, in Montreal doing weather, and I was proud to meet him, and I'm glad he gave me a chance. Uh, you know, big shoes to fill. You know, he was there, what, 30 years or so? Uh, yeah, but when I met Bill Hoagland, Mitsumi, uh, it was fun. It was fun, and I learned a lot from them. I really did. You know. Then you ended up at CBC and ended up working with Deborah Arbeck, who's actually from Pulse News as well. And you said you, ex you enjoyed your experience with her very much as well. 
That's right. I worked with her at the um, at the Weather Network uh, radio. I think it was Mix ninety six or FM ninety six. Then she went to a CTV. She did the Late Show, and then CBC hired her to do the six o'clock show, and she's still there. Yeah, I've worked with Deborah, a great person. Uh, uh, she's still at CBC. I'm not. You know, we had a lot of fun when we worked together. No, I've worked with some great people in the business, Robert. It's uh, you know, you work with good people. It makes you a better person. You learn a lot. And I have to thank all the people that uh, taught me a lot in radio and in television. So what would you say is your most glorifying experience that you had, whether it's at CJD, whether it's in Fredericton, uh, Sherbrooke, Winnipeg? What would you qualify as your most exhilarating experience that you cherish to this day? In terms of what, being on air or? Well, anything that happened. Maybe someone brought you a salami sandwich while you were doing the weather. I don't know. Maybe some, you got uh, recognized uh, well, at Paris, of course, for the weather Oscars. But maybe, uh, I don't know, Bill Hoagland to give you a compliment that you cherish to this day. Well, winning the awards, uh, you know, in Paris was a big thing. I was surprised. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was, it was great for my career. You know, uh, you come out of Paris with 120 people, uh, 130 presenters there, and you're, you're number one, and you come back home. Uh, it's, it's a nice feeling. Um, but I'd have to say my fundraising. You know, I've done fundraising now for about 20 years. There's no better feeling when you give money to a charity and they, and they thank you and they appreciate and you know you're helping a great cause. You know, I, I helped the Arthritis Society, Angelman Syndrome Foundation, the Cancer Society, the Jewish General Hospital, the Liver Foundation. I've given to various charities and everybody's so grateful. They helped me raise money. And when you see, you know, uh, kids that are at the Montreal Children's Hospital that are suffering and you can do something and help them or at Angelman Syndrome that, that have Angelman Syndrome and you can help them. It's a good feeling. You know, it's worth every second that you put into it. I think that's, I'd say that's my highlight. You know, I, I did it for 20 years. We stopped it because of the pandemic. You know, we might resume it whenever this thing ends. I, you know, I've raised close to $2 million uh, since I started uh, and I've given to every charity. I mean, the last few years was uh, Angelman Syndrome Foundation because a friend of mine, his son has Angelman Syndrome. They opened the respite center on the West Island. They need money. And now with the pandemic, um, uh, it's tough to raise money. So we'll see what happens once the pandemic comes to an end. Well, we have Bob Nag uh, here is saying that he met you at the mix and he says he was uh uh, pulling uh, your CDs every morning at 5.45. The guy was solid and always on time. Yeah, Bob uh, used to work there as well. Uh, they, he, he was there, and uh, he's right. You know, he used to, we used to use CDs then. Before vinyl, we went to, after vinyl, we went to CDs. And I was always on time. Sometimes I was still asleep because I was doing the 6 a.m. shift Saturday and Sunday morning. Uh, it, it would take a cup of coffee to wake me up. But Bob was there to greet me. And uh, we'd talk a few minutes. Then he'd leave to get some sleep. And I'd be on till uh, uh, he, he, he would keep me company. And, uh, yeah, I had fun. Uh, I had fun at Mix uh, working with Bob. And, as I mentioned, a lot of people. Uh, Pete Marier was there. And, uh, uh uh, Rob Reeford and Cat Spencer, who's now on the beat, he was there uh, when I was working there. So I met a lot of great people at Mix. You prefer radio or television? I like both. I like radio because, like I told you before, you don't really, you still have to prepare, but you don't have to worry about what you're wearing, what your hair looks like, uh, if you're wearing a, an ugly shirt, whatever. I like both. TV, you know, people get to see you. Uh, you got to look sharp and you got to sound sharp. Radio, you got to sound sharp. Um, but radio is just as, as much fun. I mean, you're playing music. I know I've done talk shows. I've done soccer shows. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy both. I, you know, if I had to choose, 
I would say I'd love to do uh, TV again, and I'd love to do radio, maybe radio during the week and filling in on TV on the weekends. Uh, you know, like right now, I'm unemployed. I'll be back in, uh, in Montreal from Florida in early April. I'd like to do I'd love to do a radio shift somewhere. I've tried, and I can still do some weather fill-in at either uh, Global, uh, CTV, or CBC. And, uh, but I like both. I really do. So you had to try your hand in politics at the last election. Was that at the federal or provincial level? Federal election uh, last September. I ran in TMR. Uh, great experience, Robert. Uh, a lot of work. I mean, listen, uh, myself and my team, Jeff Joseph and Christine and Robert and Jonah, we walked, we knocked on doors. We did about 10,000 homes, meeting people. Um, I finished second with about 10,000 votes. House father finished first with about 21,000 votes. I had a great experience. I learned a lot. I met a lot of interesting people. I was in TMR, Hampstead, Cote St. Luke, Cote de Neige, and Snowden. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. It was tiring. I didn't win. I was disappointed. Would I run again? I don't know. We'll see what happens. The conservatives now will be looking for a new leader. So we'll see what happens, who the leader is. And uh, we'll see what happens. Well, uh, Josh Array has is being wooed to go back as leaders of conservatives. Do you think he has a chance of uh, ended up uh, ending up as leader a leader once again? Yeah, he does. Um, he does have a um, a chance. I think uh, Pierre Polyev has a better chance because he's he's an MP, and they love him in Western Canada, especially and even in Ontario. If he can get uh, the, some votes in Quebec, uh, but Chere would be good. Uh, Polyev as well. Um, we'll see what happens. You know, you need someone who's bilingual and to get some votes in Quebec. Esther, Esther, saying I should get a podcast. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> listen, I, I I do a podcast on occasion. It's called What's Bothering You. It's on Facebook. Um, Don Zeno is uh, the producer, and he's on. An, as well. We do this once in a while. We did it last year, the year before during the pandemic. Um, and listen, uh, I don't mind doing a podcast, you know, but I want, I want people to participate. I mean, I, I like talking, you know, I can talk weather we on what's bothering. We talk about just about everything. We talked about the pandemic, the masks, the vaccines, the cabal. We talked about everything. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, you know, and maybe I will again. We'll see. But what's bothering you Uh, will come your way at the end of the, the end of March or early April. So just follow me on on Facebook or Instagram, and you'll find out. Did you just ask me what's bothering me? Because I'm going to tell you, Frank. What is bothering you, Robert? What's bothering me is that I'm here in this weather right now. We're getting snow tomorrow, and you're in sunny Florida, where it's a different world out there. What's it like living in Florida compared to living in Quebec? Okay, first of all, I've been here now since November. Uh, I've been tested once. I didn't get, I think maybe I got sick in December. I was, I had a sore throat and a running nose for three, four days, and that was it. Uh, I didn't see anybody die here. I know some people who live in Florida that did pass away last year before the vaccines were out. A friend of mine. Uh, the late Reno Boffis, who lived in West Palm Beach, he got COVID. He was 60, healthy, got it. Within a month, month and a half, he passed. Um, yeah, the cases went up here. But I got to tell you, Florida, to me, is the safest place to be because you're always outside. It's always warm, fresh air, the beach, the park, walking around, safest place to be. In elevators, people still wear masks. I've been here now through two and a half years of pandemic. I came in January of 2020 when the pandemic started. People were saying I was crazy. I was going to get sick. I didn't get sick. I wore a mask. I was careful. I didn't get sick. Last year, when I came down again, people would say, Frank, you're crazy, man. People are dying in Florida. I came down again. I was careful. I didn't get sick. And I got my first shot last year here, my second shot in Quebec. And now I'm eligible to go for a booster shot here in Florida. So I've been here through two and a half years of pandemic. And I've got to tell you, 
There's no safer place to be because of the weather. You're outside, fresh air. The beaches are not crowded. Forget spring break. That's one or two weeks a year where students come down and they're jam-packed. That's Fort Lauderdale. That's South Beach. If you go to Delray Beach, you go to Boca, the beaches are not crowded. You have plenty of space. You don't get sick. The media just shows the crowded beaches. Florida, to me, is safe. I know people that work as nurses down here, doctors. I asked them, how are the hospitals? One hospital was jam-packed, Jackson Memorial in Miami. And they were at 98 99%. Holy Cross in Fort Lauderdale, Delray Medical Center were, were never packed. Yeah, cases went up. But this year, people are fully vaccinated. And half of the people that are going in there are not vaccinated. So do I feel worried? Not this year. I'm double vaccinated. Last year, I wasn't worried. Why would I be worried this year? And I'm outside all the time. You've got air. You know, you go into an elevator. It says masks are required. I wear it. Some people don't wear a mask. Listen, if you're not vaccinated, it's your choice. You don't want to get vaccinated. If you get the, uh, the, the virus and you get seriously ill or die, it's your choice. This is the way I see it. You're also a sports fan. You like many sports, and among the sports, you like soccer. And your son, you said, was involved in soccer in Italy. Is he still in Italy right now playing soccer? No, my son came back. He played in Italy about a year, year and a half. He was 16. He played for a uh, uh, Primavera team down there uh, near uh, Benevento. Uh, great experience. I went and see him. I was there for a week, two weeks. Great experience. You know, I'm, I hope every 16-year-old can do that. He learned a lot. He came back. He played soccer here for uh, uh, Etoile de l'Est. He played for, I think he played for Monterey, if I'm not mistaken. Played for St. Leonard. Then he recently tore his ACL, so he stopped playing. He still plays, I think, once a week with his friends to stay in shape. Yeah, I love soccer. I think it's a beautiful game. I mean... I prefer going to a soccer game over a hockey game anytime. Uh, first of all, you're outdoors. Um, you've got 60, 70,000 people. It's a great sport. I know some people say it's boring, 0, zero 1, zero. Yeah, but, you know, there's a lot of strategy to it, a lot of running. Uh, these guys run for over 90 minutes. Now they play two, time, two times, three times a week. I love soccer, and my son loves it as well. And um, it is the fastest-growing sport in Canada. Yes, yes, it is. It's the fastest growing sport in Canada, and it's the most watched sport. It'll beat the Super Bowl. Over 2 billion people watch the World Cup final compared to 170 million that watched the Super Bowl just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, everybody plays soccer. You need cleats, a pair of shorts, and, a, and, a, and a, a jersey, and off you go. You are, of course, a European League uh, soccer fan, but how about MLS soccer? You enjoy MLS? You know what? I used to enjoy it a lot. Uh, I, I went to quite a few impact games. I lost interest when they changed the name to CF Montreal, uh, Club de Foot Montreal. I don't know why the name was changed. I mean, impact I thought was great. Um, and we're missing a big name. We had Drogba that played here. I think Montreal has to sign a big name. Toronto FC just signed Lorenzo Insigne from Napoli. Every team has a big, big name. And I think that's what the CF Montreal needs is a big, big name to get the fans back in. Of course, we've had the pandemic, so it's tough to go to the stadium, which I still can't figure out. I mean, here you go to a hockey game with 16,000 fans. Super Bowl had 70,000 fans. And at the Bell Center, you can't get 18,000 fans because it's – I don't understand how they they come, do, come down to these decisions. I really don't. Frank, this hour is, has absolutely flown by. <laughs> we're, we're getting – we got to the end of the show. I don't, I don't know. I had a lot of fun. Obviously, the audience had a lot of fun. It was a great show. Frank, with the little time that we have left here, what would your advice be to someone coming out of uh, – Let's see, Champlain College, since we uh, we plug Champlain College. They're coming out of Champlain College, graduate, and they want to go into the media. What's your uh, what's your uh, suggestions for them? Uh, what, do you, what do you advise them? Well, um, first of all, uh, try to be perfectly bilingual. If you're French, if your French is excellent, then you have a bright future in Quebec because French media is thriving. 
more than the English media. If you want to work in English media and radio, TV, uh, or social media, because now social media is big, I suggest you leave the province of Quebec, go anywhere else in Canada where English media is still doing well. I'll give you an example. I mean, Winnipeg is smaller than Montreal, but yet they have more English radio stations than Montreal does. Uh, and if you go to Toronto, which is the broadcasting capital of Canada, so many stations, Vancouver, you know, even a small town like Saskatoon has many stations or Regina or Brandon, Manitoba. So if you, if you want to do it in English, do it outside the province of Quebec. If you want to do it in French, do it in Quebec or go to Europe where they, they need French announcers. But in English, that's my opinion. I mean, some people say, well, Frank, why can't an English person work in Montreal? You could, but it's going to be a lot tougher. I found it tougher. Uh, and even now, and I started, you know, 40 years ago, and now wow. it's even tougher. I mean, it's really tough to get into English media now. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, you know, French media. And listen, we have to say the way it is, Robert. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're a Francophone, you want to work in the French media, your chances of getting in are a lot better than if you're an Allophone or if you're an uh, Anglophone. This is the way it is. I mean, I think if my name was Francois Chevalier instead of Frank Cavallaro, I'd probably be working on French media. My French is not bad. I have a bit of an accent, but I can wear, I can do weather in French. But would they ever put a Frank Cavallaro on air? There's not too many uh, Italians working in the French media except for Jeremy Filosa and uh, Pierre Olivier Zappa, and their French is perfect. And they've paid their dues, and they've really had to show that they can do the job. But in English media, I would suggest you leave the province of Quebec. Frank, such a pleasure. We had such a blast. Thank you so much for dropping by Rob's Inner Circle. I have one final request. Yes. <laughs> are we, are we going to have you back on our show sometime in the future? Sure. Let me know. Maybe when I come back to Montreal. What, what the great weather in the suitcase. When you open it up, it's going to be spring. It's going to be summer. The flower is going to be flourishing. I hope so. I hope so. Last year, I came back uh, first week of April. and We had snow four days after I got there. You know, I was looking outside my balcony. I said, here we are, April 4th, and I think we're 5th, and we were getting snow. I wanted to come back later, but I can't. I have to come back. First of all, you can't stay here that long. You can't stay more than six months. It'll be almost five months that I've been down here. Uh, but I love Florida, Robert. Honestly, you know, you, people are so nice here. You can speak any language you want. You want to order a coffee in English, in Spanish, in French. They don't <laughs> criticize you. This ain't Quebec. I mean, in Quebec, you go to Tim Orange, can I have a coffee with two cream, no sugar? Qua! Qua! <laughs> what is it, a duck? Here you, speak, <laughs> here you speak any language you want. And to the Legault government, Instead of spending time and money with the language, spend more time and money for the homeless and buying more beds for the hospital. And next time, if there's another wave, our hospitals won't be overcrowded like they have been the last couple of years. Don't worry about language. French language is not dying in Quebec. French language is thriving. When's the last time you saw an English sign in Montreal? Frank, thank you so much. We're going to be signing up. Stick around. We're going to have our meet and greet with the producer and the techie. So stay where you are. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> Folks, there you have it. That was our guest tonight, Frank Cavallaro, coming to you live from Florida. Join us on Wednesday at noon when Esther Brzezinski and I co-host Noon Hour Out of the Box. And the topic this week is going to be bullying. And we also have the extended version of Noon Hour Out of the Box every Saturday on accessradio.ca. We're on from noon to 3 p.m. Finally, join Esther this upcoming Thursday as she welcomes at 8 p.m. in the Eastern Time Zone. Esther's broadcast, she's going to have an amazing guest. So you don't want to miss him. He's a writer, producer, and director from Hollywood. It's on this channel Thursday, 8 p.m. Thank you to all for joining us, and God bless you. We'll see you next time. Ciao.